Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gnostic Media's, or is it uh, Logos Media's podcast, Unspun Podcast, episode number 115. And uh, I say Logos Media because we're changing uh, the website and the YouTube channel and everything over to Logos Media in the coming weeks. I think I mentioned that a couple weeks ago. Holly and I have a lot of research to cover. Boy, I should have gotten a uh, cup of water before we start. I'll have to find something to cover the screen with and and uh, get one. Maybe I can go send my son in the background if I can grab a cup of water. But um, so we have a whole lot of research to cover that uh, we've been doing over the last several weeks and we haven't had a chance to really sit down and present it all. We had hoped to do a live update from Salem last Monday and uh, just time flew by. So uh, let's see. Holly is in Maine right now. And of course, I'm in California. Unfortunately, we can't, uh, you know, do the show together in the same location today. But um, anyway, Holly and I have been working on our book and the current working title is Salem Solved. Poisons and Plagues in America's Witch City, and here's a uh, uh, a copy. It still has a lot more to go, and you know, behind me, the new the new backdrop there is uh, just some of the Salem books that we are currently trying to get through to uh, expose this whole cover up and fiasco. And uh, so, anyway, Holly, welcome back. Hey, thanks. Um, just a quick note. We've got uh, 18 people watching and the uh, information, the show notes on this uh, episode, I think is incorrect. I think it's from the last one. So we're just going to do a uh, Salem. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Update, yeah. So. Sorry. I uh, did accidentally leave the old notes down there in the comments. So basically, we're just going by what is in the subject, and let me delete the rest right now. And that is removed, and uh, I'll update that and correct everything later, but right now we're just going by the description. And uh, one thing that I need to say is this is probably going to be a pretty dark show. Uh, we don't, you know, it's... It's hard to even cover this topic and what Holly and I have found over the last few weeks. And uh, so, you know, we're going to encourage people to skip out on Halloween this year and things like that because of just how deep this goes. Maybe that seems extreme, but uh, maybe by the time you've seen this episode and what we're about to present, you won't think so. You have anything to add there? Um, we spent how many days? Three days in Salem last week doing research, taking photographs, talking to the locals. Taking names. <laughs> taking names, getting a bigger idea about the, uh, the history of Salem as one of the biggest, largest, most populous and richest countries in early colonial America and connecting that thread from the very founding of the North American experiment, if you will, up to this today and the crazy tourism industry that we see in Salem. If you ever get a chance to go over there, it's a, it's a real trip and it had the tourism season hasn't really even started up yet. They, really start up after school gets out and then they have, you know, it gets crazy the whole week of Halloween. So we were pretty busy those, those three days gathering some information, getting a bunch of books, a ton of books. And we have some pretty interesting threads that we've connected over the past week. So, um, Hey everyone. Indeed. Hello everyone. And, uh, Oh boy. So, Wow. This is going to be dark, folks. Um, we hate to tell you that, you know, it's such a dark subject, but, um, you know, I, we think that we've solved the, the Salem case. And we came out back in, what, February or March saying that, uh, uh, that we had tied it to inoculations. And we've found a whole additional level to that, 
we're going to uh, inoculation experiments we think we're definitely involved but we also have a whole new level with the research and uh so we're going to be, uh, first off, we're going to start off by discussing cinnabar, which is mercury ore. And um, so, interestingly, we're going to start off by discussing a TV show called uh, Salem. It's a series, and I'm going to show that on the screen here. And uh, so this this is about uh, the show Salem, and they call it, you know, they're talking about the red mercury. We call it angel's tears for the pain it causes us to make it and the remorse we felt when we had to use it. And so this, well, Holly, why don't you uh, go on a little bit on this? Well, I've never actually seen the show, but uh, Jan and I have been guessing that there really was some sort of chemical or poison that was used upon the afflicted Salem girls. So if you followed any of the history about the effects, any of the symptoms that the girls had, and Salem was the largest incidence of these afflictions as they were called, but it was happening in Europe for about a century or two before, and then it started to happen in North America sporadically and of course, Salem was the Salem, Massachusetts and Salem Village was the largest concentration of these afflictions. So these girls and women were having these very bizarre um, effects. And the mainstream story of how, what Salem happened was both, you know, mass hysteria. The girls were bored. They were lying. They were repressed under Puritan culture. Uh, ergot, ergot has been ergot's been thrown around uh we started to examine if jimson weed or detoro could have been a possibility there was also a yellow fever plague going on in the boston salem area which is bizarre because it's more of a warm weather uh mosquito type of infection and it was hitting salem and massachusetts new england during the time there was also the bubonic plague so the pustules and smallpox that was coming they claimed it was from the boats that came from you know pre-columbian times either started in the west indies and then spread into europe and into north america and we examined all of those symptoms why don't and i that, you know, why, why don't i show you want to should we show them the chart now or is it too yeah, soon yeah go ahead yeah that's fine all right, so uh, we're going to show you a chart that we started putting together while researching for the book. And uh, so when we started plugging all of this stuff in, and I'm going to cover us over here to show this. So um, basically down the left column here where it says, girls, we have the symptoms that they experienced during the uh, Salem Witch Trials event. And uh, so we can see sweating, pain, sprains, deaf and blind, dumb. Uh, they couldn't speak. Their tongue would lock up or they would swallow their tongue. Lockjaw, barking, red marks, knives, hallucinations, agitation, memory losses, seizures, choking, vomiting, neck twist, mydriasis. So all of these things are what we just uh, we looked at. And we started going through the typical symptoms list of what is out there and what is claimed. So the first column going down here, we have ergot. And we can see that ergot hits on some of these points. and um, But we see that a lot of them are missing here. So, you know, we know it's probably not locked. Up. There was no uh, deafness, sweating. There was no dumbness. Um uh, the red marks weren't there. You you get more, uh, I forget what it's called, when you get really cold instead. Um, they Typically, it, uh, hallucinations are shown to it, you know, but I'm not sure the kind that they were talking about. You know, we could check that one. But agitation, memory loss, choking, vomiting, etc. were not involved in that. And then next we looked at Jimson weed, which is uh, this next column here going down. And we see that and that was one of the theories. That's Datura. Or, or, yeah, that's Datura. And now I'm forgetting who put that theory forward. It's uh, in our book notes. I have it uh, 
here someplace, but... Um, Someone with his getting his PhD suggested that. That's the only time I'd heard about it. And as we had talked about in previous episodes, there was the, it was called Jamestown weed, Jimson weed, because it had been used upon soldiers in early Jamestown and was reported that people, someone had fed uh, soldiers some Jimson weed, which was found all over North America. And they basically went crazy for a week. So it was uh, sort of suggested that it could have been a possibility. They talk about mydriasis, which is pupil dilation, and people know that's also belladonna, which is also detora. But uh, the symptoms seemed to kind of come and go, and it didn't exactly seem to fit with the symptoms of the afflicted girls. So it was one of our closer theories, along with, um, as we have talked about, before as well it could have been under like early mk ultra basically like torture mind control could have been part of the whole the whole psyop if you will of salem so uh and thank you matt for the 20 dollar donation of course we are listener sponsored and do most of this all the book purchases back there and everything uh we have to pay for it with your help so thank you all for supporting the show <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, Jimson weed. Now I'm just looking for the guy's name who started that theory and, uh, I'm, I'm missing it here. Uh, anyway, uh, it was a famous German doctor. For, oh no, that was something else. Anyway, sorry. So, so how long is our, is our, uh, book so far? Uh, Almost up to a hundred pages now. No, we're at like 113 <laughs> pages right now and we still have so much work to put into it. It's not even funny. I need to reread it. I've already, I'm already starting to forget what we wrote. So I, I haven't read it for like a week or two. <laughs> so, okay. So now getting back to Mercury and this whole Angel's Tears thing, uh, it was also known as Red Mercury among the alchemists. It's a bright scarlet gemstone like globe. So this is what they're calling it in this witch TV show that we mentioned, the Salem TV show. And this is what they're talking about here. And they says it causes unimaginable devastation. And so, uh, you know, uh, in this show, the Sentinel commissioned Sebastian von Marburg to deliver the pennant containing red mercury to the captain of the French troops so that the artifact could have been used up to blow up Salem, just as they already did at Deerfield when uh, John Ald Alden massacred the French in their camp in order to save Billy. He was informed in time by a French captain to avoid trying to break open the locket. Okay, so they're hiding it in this locket. Of course, you know, that's sort of a misdirection on it. But they, the issue is, is that they're talking about red mercury, and that is true. So people think red mercury, well, quick silver, it's, it's not silver, it's, or it's not red, it's silver. And we're going to show you in just a minute how it is actually red. And they, uh, after making sure the Dark Lord and the Sentinel against each other, and you've got the loyalty of Sebastian, Sib Marley managed to steal the pendant of Red Mercury, then showing it to Cotton Mather as proof of her will to put an end to the Great Terror. So this, this is all in this crazy show uh, called Salem. So they're actually really telling us the true history of the Salem Witch Trials. Uh, somebody over there, the writers of the show, know the truth. And Alden, and Alden is trying to prevent the explosion of red mercury. Okay, so, and, and the explosion is actually going to be a plague, and uh, we'll go into that here more in a bit. And unfortunately for them, the Sentinel activated the instrument, depositing inside the portion of red mercury, then entrusting the dark, dark object to Thomas Dinley to keep it safe in his shop. So why are we discussing this uh, show, uh, you know, this TV show? And, you know, somebody's asking Logos Media. We discussed at the beginning of the show where we are changing everything to Logos Media. Logosmedia.com is active now, but everything is not switched over yet. So that'll be happening over the coming weeks and months. It's a lot of work. But the Sentinel states... Your alchemists call it red mercury. We call it angel's tears for the pain it causes us to make it and the remorse we felt when we had to use it. When we were sent to slaughter the Canaanites, we wept. Okay, now keep in mind that the Puritans come from Purim, 
and the Purim slaughter the Canaanites and the Amalekites, such as in the book of Esther, they slaughter the 25,000 based on getting uh, Mordecai gets Esther to lie. And then uh, going on, uh, when we delivered the plagues, we wept. When we delivered the plagues, we wept. In other words, they caused the plagues. But beware for Samuel, that boy, when he killed every firstborn of every mother in Egypt, his eyes were as dry as the desert. So they're saying that, you know, they're doing this stuff on purpose, but they're telling you, more importantly, really the core mystery behind Salem. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, Holly and I went up to the one of the, uh, the world's largest countries, largest uh, mines, uh, gold mines called the Empire Mine up in Northern California. And uh, at the Empire Mine, let me see if I can find these images. They have uh, images of cinnabar. Now, uh, we're going to show you this. Uh, it's surprising to see cinnabar is a white stone, and it can be actually, in many cases, polished into a uh, gemstone. So here is different cinnabar from different areas, California, Nevada, uh, and uh, but cinnabar does come from other places. It used to be imported from Spain. And where was uh, the other place, Holly? Um, well, it's found across the United States and the West as well. Um, but it seems like the main cinnabar uh, mining site in Europe would have been in Spain. There's also connections to Asia. Now, uh, cinnabar was used a lot in jewelry making, etc. And uh, enamel, you can see there's a lot of famous uh, cinnabar, uh, ancient Chinese art. So cinnabar has been used for art purposes. And I think we started to examine the idea of cinnabar. And yes, some people in the chat are already seeing where we're going with this and the connection to cinnabar and uh, the red stone or the philosopher's stone. So some people are already jumping ahead a little bit. So the uh, the stone, I think we started to think about other possibilities for the poison that could have been used upon people when uh, we started to think about metals and if metal poisoning could have been used. And Jan, of course, mentioned the idea of the hatter or the mad hatter, or if people were using mercury for hat making in Salem, which uh, hat making and furriers and the beaver and, uh, and pelt was very popular in New England, and it was part of major trade in early colonial America. And when we were walking through uh, Salem the other day, we actually passed the Felter's house, you know, so that was interesting to find that. And uh, so, you know, and we I just had to get rid of a, an idiot in the in the chat. We're going to have stupid people because we're exposing all of this. And there's a lot of paid trolls out there against us right now. So sorry for the interruption, folks. Um, anyway, let's see. So it, that was what put me on to the idea that mercury was being used. And so Holly and I were researching one night and I said, hey, can you look up the effects of mercury for me? And I put together, you know, hatters and felts and fur and all of this beaver furs. And so, you know, pretty soon we were looking at mercury and then it was like, OK, well, you know, where does mercury come from? And then Holly finds cinnabar, and then that just kind of blew the whole thing wide open. And, uh, you know, so then um, we could, you know, using this chart that I had up on screen here, uh, we started, you know, we had compared all of these different things, smallpox, black plague, yellow fever, great pox, and syphilis, and we would get, you know, a few hits here and there. And uh, but then there was, you know, missing categories that really didn't quite hit. And then we started thinking, well, what about hypnosis? And so then we added a hypnosis column and said, you know, well, you know, like someone like uh, Darren Brown out of England, he shows he can cause people to do a lot of these things uh, just on that show. But again, we still had uh, missing segments with uh, hypnosis. And then we put in autism and some of those things to compare and you know of course autism was very rare back then because people weren't given vaccines and mercury etc and then uh, so then we put in mercury and cinnabar and we started looking up uh, what's that uh, 
Hachimoto's disease? It's called Minamata disease. So there had been a strong incidence. If people just want to look in Wikipedia real quick, uh, there's Minamata disease and they show someone with like their, their hand all contorted and uh, they were uh, just the symptoms in a lot of ways mimic the ways in which the girls were and uh, the young women in Salem were, were going crazy, basically. Right. Now, somebody's asking, is there proof they were poisoned? I suppose, you know, if you wanted to ignore all of the firsthand accounts there and all of the uh, court documents there of the symptoms and the doctor's reports and everything. And again, these are the symptoms in this first column here that uh, are reported in the official reports on the Salem witch trials. Uh, these are the symptoms that are reported. So, you know, if you sit there and say, oh, well, it's all made up and it's all BS, then you would have to ignore that. But if you actually take it seriously, rather than just ignoring it, uh, what we did is we took it seriously and then, you know, it's all on court record, etc. So when we start plugging this in, these symptoms, uh, and then when we compared them to mercury in this column, well, ladies and gentlemen, we got a hit on just about everything with a question mark on sprains. So, you know, that was a big surprise. And with mercury, there were many more symptoms, too, that uh, that we didn't include because they weren't symptoms of the girls in this category here. But with and I, I just want to say, like, we're talking about like 400 years ago, almost, you know, or more. 326. So, yeah. yeah. So I think, you know, in a lot of ways, we can never really be sure about what exactly happened. You know, I know uh, it seems like from the the what people are describing, especially with the initial couple of girls that were exhibiting symptoms, especially under the care of Cotton Mather, these uh, young girls had very specific symptoms. And as we saw when someone commented that, you know, it did turn into a witch hunt in the sense that adults were accusing other adults and so forth. And there could have been many different facets to this, uh, to the uh, trials, as we know, you know, people having personal vendettas against other people, etc. I'm not throwing that uh, away any of that i'm just we're just trying to look at the initial what really started the the symptoms i mean the the idea that they were convulsing and they had like their their necks were contorted their hands were contorted their tongues were swollen they had these symptoms that you can't really exactly explain away with just overreaction or or, or psychology girls, or right, hypnosis or the something the girls being bored you know is is a very common uh excuse we saw right. in yeah because Salem. you know women all of the all of the feminist bullshit that you know the books that talk about Salem oh the girls were suppressed and bored so they you know they just made this up and you know and then you start reading about uh the history of all of this and, and you start seeing how much uh, the, these feminist stories are made up. And, um, you know, like uh, one of the biggest things that's quoted is the Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawth Hawthorne, which was published in uh, the eight in 1850, which is 100, you know, 58 years after the events at Salem. And then they say, oh, well, these women were suppressed, but you can see uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne promoting uh, the whole witchcraft theme in the book and he's promoting the whole agenda. And we go to, we went to Salem when we started investigating uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne. Of course, uh, uh, he was of a very wealthy family and this is his house uh, right on the edge of the harbor in uh, Salem. It's called, the house is called the Seven Gables because uh, each of these peaks on the house were, it was very difficult architecture to do that. And people had to be very wealthy to pull that kind of architecture off. And so Nathaniel Hawthorne, oops, also lived literally right on the edge of the water. And uh, let's see here. Here's, oh man, every time I click an image, it jumps off the screen here. And so we, you know, here, you know, this is the Seven Gables house. And then it goes straight into the, uh, you know, the bay there right off his, his property. So, you know, I was leaning on the fence of the of the the ocean there, essentially, to take that uh, that photo. Now, uh, so the Nathaniel Hawthorne, 
uh, I spoke to Chris uh, Dalgan of uh, the the guy who does the tunnels research in Salem, and he says that uh, the Seven Gables house, which was built in the 1670s, was one of the first homes to actually have tunnels connected to it. And uh, Dalgan, oops, I got the wrong window up here. Uh, Dalgan had sent me some interesting notes on that. And uh, let me see this if I... This is when things start to get weird, guys. Yeah, you know, <laughs> this is, yeah, de- definitely. So uh, he says that, let me see, Nathaniel Hawthorne's house was built in 1667 and the House of Gables was built in uh, 1668. They are both attached to tunnels. They are both connected, and, and I'm quoting... Uh, Chris uh, Dalgan here, and thanks, Chris, for the notes for this. Uh, he's He does tours in Salem on the tunnels and everything. And uh, they are both connected to the merchants who would be using them in the 1800s and beyond. And so we think that there is definitely something to these this whole tunnel history. And uh, we also, well, I don't want to jump too far ahead here, but Nathaniel Hawthorne's book, The Scarlet's, uh, Scarlet Letter, is a pro-witchcraft book, and it plays up that the Puritans were Christian when they were uh, technically, you could call them, crypto-Jews. Hawthorne was a Puritan descendant, and he published uh, his book, The Scarlet Letter, 25 years after Puritan Puritanism ended. And it was ended when... Uh, where's my Charles Upham book? Did I forget to bring it down, of all things? Someone's mentioning about the tunnels. Yeah, people are already jumping down that uh, rabbit hole of you. Oh, yeah. You, so. know, you know, what What do you traffic in tunnels? You know, right. uh, when we were in Salem, there's the Pirate Museum. There's rum running. There would have been drugs, people, etc. Exactly. So, so now in, in 1824, the guy who wrote this book on Salem take took over the first church of Salem. Now... We actually did get to the first church of Salem. It's still there. Unfortunately, recently, the, the last minister left the church, and we met several of the last six attendees who uh, belong to the church. Unfortunately, I didn't get a photograph of the church itself. I got a church of all the signs, and you can see that they even the church was trying to promote the agenda there. Uh, but, um, so this was originally the first church of Salem, uh, Salem village, and they renamed it when they renamed it Danvers, but that is, uh, the church where most of the stuff happened, which is a half a block from the meeting house. But, uh, and then they have this, this memorial, which, uh, is, uh, there's a lot of hokey baloney stuff in the whole presentation here but this is a about a half a block down the street from the first church of salem and then uh, across the street is you know this guy's house where supposedly the the original townhouse was but uh going back to hawthorne uh, the hawthorne family also owned the very exclusive hawthorne hotel a few blocks away from the uh, seven gables house in downtown salem and uh, so, you know, the, we have this very wealthy family. He's writing the disinformation 158 years later. He's tied to the Hawthorne Hotel and the tunnels. And he's clearly selling the agenda of witchcraft, of course. And just to say, after Puritanism had ended, it was cool for all of the former Puritans and, uh, like, you know, descendants of the Puritans, etc., to jump on it as Christianity to sell the agenda. So I and to just mention for everyone, his grandfather, John Hawthorne, John Hawthorne was one of the judges during the Salem trials. So he was one of the wealthy merchants, part of the court of Terminer and Oyer, which would have been the proceedings overseeing the events. And of course, they use something called spectral evidence, which is people accusing others um, without any sort of specific evidence, it was all spectral, if you will. And uh, and then Nathaniel Hawthorne also wrote something called Young Goodman Brown, which was a short story which spelled out that the people of Salem and Danvers were engaging in satanic rituals. So this was promoted. They called it Gothic Romanticism. And of course, this inspired if you're into H.P. Lovecraft or Gothic Horror all of this sprang out of this era. So 
just one more facet for people to look into. And if you want to see the memorial that Jan just put up, that's all technically in Danvers, Massachusetts. Right. We had to look around and try to find it actually took place in Salem Village, which was the outskirts, which is now Danvers. And, and Salem, the city, really ha- didn't have near as much to do with it. Maybe they could claim, if it's even valid, that the hangings took place there. But really, it was all in Salem Village or Danvers. And so Salem, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, included like five or seven cities, including uh, uh, Salem Village, Salem City, and uh, what, what are some of the other cities again? Uh, there also, um, it would have encompassed uh, Beverly. Beverly, Massachusetts as well. And uh, all, all the way out to Quincy, Mass, um, was where the, Mayfla- the uh, Maypole, Marymount happened. And so there's like five or six different towns in that area where they all would have been, that all would have been Salem at the time. Correct. And uh, Christopher Romanoff says Salem, a very important port for the late 1800s. Uh, Whaling oil is actually more in the early 1800s. I think by the 1840s, the Salem port had been uh, starting to shut down because the, uh, the, uh, the bay wasn't deep enough for the larger ships at that time. And so that's, you know, Salem was up until then probably the richest city in America and considered sort of a country unto its own. Uh, Ginger is saying satanic or pagan. There's really no difference there when you get into it, but that's for a whole other discussion. Uh, People can go back and look at the older shows I've already done covering a lot of that kind of material. But uh, so there, there are these tunnels running uh, under Salem and a lot of them were covered up, you know, and thanks again to Chris Dowgan for uh, sending some of these. He argues that, uh, this is the opening uh, or the uh, for what was one of the Salem underground train stations. And this here as well. Sorry, folks, about it. Keep it's jumping around here. But uh, there are all these there's all of these tunnels that run under Salem. And then when you get into here, you can see that, you know, there's the, the Salem train station and these tunnels running under the city here. All of this stuff has been closed and wiped out over the years and the color photos are thanks and credit to chris daugan uh and these are of course uh for uh, open use or whatever but uh so these are just showing some of these tunnels and things uh going under the city of course uh this uh just recently the whole tucson child smuggling thing was going on there now what we also suspect is that uh There's a whole lot of phony baloney regarding the quote-unquote underground railroads and the uh, the slaves freeing the north. And you know, we're told that if if you go on Wikipedia, for instance, and uh, if you type in, let's say, uh, underground railroad, and I'm just going to do that just to show people here. If you live in New England, you can pretty much assume that there were underground tunnels under your city. So uh, it was a network of secret routes and safe houses established in the late 1800s. Uh, let's see. And then if you if you read through this, and I have before, it says that they weren't really tunnels. Uh, let's see here. But it, it's, it's in, in there, there somewhere. somewhere. But it, it says, says that they, they weren't really tunnels. And then you realize, and one of the people that we spoke to that worked at one of the museums at, in uh, Salem, he explained to us that uh, he kind of already thought of this idea and that the Tunnels ran from Virginia to uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And so, you know, these were massive uh, smuggling tunnels. So it's very likely that the slaves actually went through real underground railroad tunnels. And they, of course, don't want to talk about these tunnels because, as we discovered with Pizzagate a couple years ago and this stuff happening right now, a lot of human trafficking... uh, a lot of human trafficking, my, my wife gives me the shush on that, happens on uh, with these underground tunnels. So uh, you start getting into some pretty dark uh, areas when you, know, when you look into these tunnels. And then uh, Chris said, uh, beginning in 1839, there were railroad tunnels owned by Peabody JP, the purpose. And uh, we're not the only ones to realize this is that this is... Uh, 
oh yeah, this is quoting myself here, uh, that the slaves were brought out of the southern plantations to fill the factories in the north. In fact, many former slaves were immediately put to work in the Massachusetts shoe factories to supply the northern army. So this is a big hush-hush. They emptied the plantations in the south, created this underground railroad system to traffic them into the north and to fill the new factories for the Industrial Revolution. But that's, you know, we we only found one person willing to discuss that at all. And uh, he had, you know, had information, you know, he, he was willing to tell us a little bit. So in 1839, it was built for the Eastern Railway, a railroad owned by George Peabody. And then that ties into J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, etc., which is now his bank. And uh, so... Peabody was also a major shareholder in many of the other trains, including the BO built by Alexander Brown. Peabody also bailed out his own son's bank during the 1837 panic, Brown Brothers. So that became Brown Brothers Harriman. And later, a uh, track uh, that merged with Frog through the tunnel was built by Thomas H. Perkins, who controlled Baring Brothers Bank. Uh, through two nephews who were major partners. This track went to Lowell. And so, and then uh, he also says that it's possible that one of the governors, either in 1624, Roger Conant, uh, 1628, John Endicott, 1630, John Winthrop, uh, may have prompted the tunnels. And then he also stated that uh, the navigational acts could have also prompted them uh, the most important navigation acts were enacted in 1651, 1660, 1663, 1673, and 1696. And so, you know, here we have these tunnels that tie into this, the trafficking of humans. Uh, everywhere we looked in just about all the books and the histories, we also see the trafficking of disease. So uh, quickly, you just did a, a great job talking about the connection, Who, which families owned the tunnels in Salem and how they were connected to the large banks. And then, of course, uh, Chris mentions that those banks all founded the Federal Reserve and connected to the Bank of England. And we saw, Jan, you have a book that talks about how Salem was one of the wealthiest merchant towns in the United States, one of the largest banking towns. And they would use the tunnels to usurp the customs houses. So people might not know that the United States was founded on tariffs, you know, so, the, so and so just we need to show the audience. Sorry. Oh, okay. Here's the, here's the bay. And then I'll let my wife continue. Sorry. All right. But, um, and then uh, here is the U S customs house directly across the street from that. So they would have wanted any way possible to, to get their goods away from these custom houses. Right. So we saw the history of Salem as a city being intimately involved with the War of 1812, which uh, people are are extremely ignorant about the War of 1812. And it was basically a banking war. And what ended up happening is uh, Jan, with a book that he just showed, a, a lot of those families just sailed away in the 1830s after a big bank crash. And of course, these banks all, and all these families, of course, connected with Salem, all started to fill in. And the, the founding of the Federal Reserve is, is directly tied into Salem. So that's just another interesting facet to the whole story. If you start to look at tunnels and Jan and I took a pretty uh, kitschy tour of, it was the Pirate Museum, the Salem Correct. Pirate Museum. And like all of it, I think it was, a lot of these were built in the late 70s, these museums. So I recommend you you take a tour, but the, all the pirates and stuff are all wax. And and that's kind, probably the best one of all the tours, though. Yeah, and it was pretty telling, though, because like the last half of the museum, you're walking through a tunnel and they're talking about how Salem was you know, basically founded upon people smuggling. Didn't I put and, photos of that in here? I could have sworn I had photos ready to know. show people. So that. Maybe that, I thought it was too kitschy to show people. Thanks, Anthony, for your uh, 999 donation. We do appreciate it. Please support the show, everyone. Uh, much appreciated for that. And uh, anybody else who's donated, uh, we already thanked Matt during the show. But, uh, yeah, I was just looking for the quote here where he talks about them sailing off and basically fleeing uh, when the war, you know, 
<laughs> and and Holly and I have a whole theory about the Federalists and the Royalists, et cetera, and who is supporting uh, what. But, you know, you really have to read between the lines with these people. I mean, you know, I call this guy a Salemophile. Uh, he really just, um, you know, anything that the, the Salem people were involved in, he is pro and uh, you really have to read be read between the lines. Oh wow! Thanks again, Anthony, for the uh, uh, additional twenty there. Or uh, that was was that a different Anthony? Uh, that was a different Anthony. So thank you both, <laughs> Anthony's. Wow, appreciate that so much. <laughs> so you know, okay. So this guy, and we should get back up in the notes here for the show. Quiet Storm asked if we got scared by the uh, the dude in the mask at the pirate museum. We, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so well, and Holly said, "Well, that guy just moved." And I went back, and as I'm saying, I think that's a guy in a mask. He went, "Ah," you know. So, <laughs> so totally worth it. I mean, even though we just spoiler alert. Sorry, yeah, guys. Spo yeah, sorry. Sp sorry for the spoiler alert. But, uh, you know, so you got to get in there. You know, there's so many, so many dang books to read on this. And uh, uh, Jazzy Girl is asking if she can donate too, if that's what you can afford. Yeah, please do. I mean, every bit helps. We're using it to pay for all the books and research and trips and, and everything. And I've got and my own. Uh, I've got a Patreon. I got to get Jan on the Patreon. If you have Patreon or PayPal instead, um, that would help too. And Keep reminding, I'll keep reminding Jan to get on the Patreon thing. Yeah, and somebody sent me an email to get that on there uh, too. So let's see what else was there. Uh, I want to get back over to the notes here because we have so much in our notes to share. Where are they? So, all right. So we covered most of this, uh, this Salem dark TV show and, uh, you know, what they were doing. So now we want to get into... And I read his quote. All you, or here's, did I, let me see. So, has yeah. anyone seen that Salem TV show? We haven't seen it yet. You I, know, I've we, seen some of them and it's pretty dark, but uh, sorry, I keep flipping around windows here. There's too much going on. But yeah, I mean, uh, they, they definitely play up things. But um, so, you know, regarding Cotton Mather, we found some quotes regarding him. And this is from the American Antiquarian uh, Society. And they have, you know, they're showing the link on there. You can pause the video or whatever if you want to copy that down. Uh, so, oh, says it cannot be opened right now. So I'll have to switch that. But he said, uh, Mercury, we know thee, but we are afraid thou wilt kill us too if we employ thee to kill them that kill us, you know, and, you know, quotes like this are really telling when you understand that the Puritans, uh, that the name Puritan comes from the Purim, which is in the, the book of Esther and the Old Testament about uh, Mordecai and Esther lying and then having uh, uh, to the king that they were Jews and then having uh, Esther's one wish was to have Haman and his sons and all of his 75,000 followers killed. And so the the king or uh, ordering or honoring Esther's wish uh, kills all of Haman's people. And it just goes to show the power of a beautiful woman because Esther was supposed to be the most beautiful woman uh, in uh, the whole kingdom. And it goes to show the, you know, power, the, the power a beautiful woman can have over men. And uh, even if he's the king of the land. So, you know, of course the story in there is spun, but I uh, see uh, going on, you know, just the, the way for the circulation of the blood and the lymph, uh, and so that serve purposes of medicine and nothing like mercurial deobstruents of which cinnabar of antimony, Ethiop's mineral and antihetic of Poterius may be reckoned the principal. And then uh, going on, uh, Dr. Morgan observes, he who shall go about the cure and hectic without primary and chief regard to scurvy of which is a symptom will find himself unhappily mistaken for this cries uh, up certain mercurial antimonial preparations but you know in in the research on salem and on cotton mather we can find 
quotes about uh, Cotton Mather using and recommending Cinnabar. And then he is watching the girls, and we can see that early or not, you know, we can see today that, for instance, you know, uh, mercury thimerosal is used in vaccines. Well, back then they were making these brews for these inoculations, et cetera, and we'll go more into the brews uh, that would go to, you know, the inoculations and using cinnabar, et cetera, and, you know, causing craziness, et cetera, in the people for control. And so, uh, you know, these are just some of the quotes that uh, we found from that book from the uh, Antiquarian Society there. So people can check that out. So uh, some people might think this is kind of far out that we're mentioning cinnabar and mercury and people in the chat already know about this as alchemy and the philosopher's stone. Well, guess what? Cotton Mather and all of these people, Isaac and all these famous scientists were, guess what? They were alchemists, you know, people who came up with the theory of gravity, Newton, Cotton Mather, who was a major propagandist, a doctor, all these members of Royal Society, all these people who founded modern day enlightenment and scientism, they were all dabbling in alchemy and would have known, as people have pointed out, how to have taken cinnabar and have transmuted into it, it into quicksilver, etc. This would have been a pretty basic knowledge if you were studying alchemy that's why they call it the philosopher's stone because you can then use quicksilver as we have discovered to sift out gold etc so all of this technology would have been available i mean people act like people from hundreds of years ago were stupid but people were extremely well read and in fact much better educated than most people today i would argue Correct. So, and a lot of people also think that, you know, oh, well, there were no witches at Salem, et cetera. Well, take a look at Cotton Mather and, and actually read the stuff that he was doing. I mean, some of that stuff was See, pretty evil. So but, you know, here's the thing and all of these books behind me and Holly has a bunch more too, but all of these books behind me on Salem, all of them ridicule the idea of witchcraft, <laughs> but none of them even define what witchcraft is. Now, to me, if you're going to do, oh, where did I put that? If you're going to do a bunch of books on witchcraft, you should at least know what witchcraft is. Now, where did, <laughs> I'm looking at my, how do you pronounce that? Maleficus, Malef- Malice, Malicus Maleficarum, if people are into researching witchcraft, you know, that's, that's the, the book for sure. Hammer of the Heretics. Yep, exactly. And then there's several other, uh, several others, and they should be here somewhere. Oh goodness! But uh, there's too many books here to go through. Apparently. He's getting lost in books now. Help him. Yes. Okay. So here's another one here that's really good. Uh, this is by John Hale on witchcraft, and he wrote this in 1697, shortly after the trials. And uh, but you know what people have to understand is that. What these books show as witchcraft is stuff that's commonly accepted today that was sold to us largely by people like Aldous Huxley and the MKUltra program. So uh, birth control, that was considered witchcraft. And uh, causing abortions, that was considered witchcraft. Uh, If you took most of the things that Planned Parenthood does today, those things were considered witchcraft. And so these were things that were against the family and against natural law. So, you know, you didn't just, you know, go have sex to be promiscuous. You were committed to someone in a relationship before you ever had sex. So it wasn't like, you know, people today just, oh, women are liberated because of birth control pills. All it just means is that, you know, we don't have to be responsible for, you know, for our bodies and the proper, you know, what nature is giving us. We're going to take chemicals to stop the natural process of our body, which, of course, if you look at natural, it's against nature. So therefore, it's against natural law. So these sort of things and using uh, herbs to cause impotency in men or to cause hallucinations and craziness and to cause plagues and killing people. These things were all plagues or I just gave something away. We're all witchcraft. And so, 
you know, uh, is somebody, there's a troll in there. No, I'm not going to bother answering to a ridiculous troll letter that's all lies. If you uh, can't use critical thinking you're on your own, then, you know, that's all that the comment deserves. So, and I've blocked them. You know, every show we get trolls because of what we do, and there's a lot of trolls. And as we've been exposing all of this stuff, you know, people that we used to think were friends and that we worked with, got exposed to. And, you know, that's the way it goes. Unfortunately, you know, we can't, you know, every, all of these people think up different lies and it's hard to figure out everybody's lie. I mean, you got to read an 800 or thousand page book sometimes to see somebody's tricks and their false rhetoric and stuff. And that's just, you know, how it goes. Go ahead. Okay, so um, getting back to what you were saying about uh, poisons and connecting this back to the Salem witch trials. So um, this was we had the Salem witch trials was the largest New England witch hunt, if you will. But it was going on for a century or more in Europe. And those those books were very popular. And a lot of times they also mention the use of animals. So they talk about the witches familiar. They talk about people's cows and pigs being poisoned. And this was a very common accusation in Salem as well. So it, it was a very common accusation throughout the entire trials to say that people's cows were ill or they died or their pigs and mentioning these uh, animals over and over again being used in witchcraft. And so we started to look at you know, how would these how would these diseases and these plagues that people were accusing witches of such as, you know, cowpox or smallpox? How are these diseases being transmitted and shared in town? So and in throughout Europe and the United States. So this is all part of further research that we're doing. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. The, the dark types that come out when you expose this stuff. And unfortunately, the more we've delved in with the more we've found here. So I'm just trying to find the notes here again. Um, so now Cotton Mather, he's using these things. Uh, he's using mercury. They're all alchemists. Um, one of the quotes and this and is, uh, Odysseys, he mentions uh, Polydame as excelling in this way of usefulness. I call to mind Mr. George Herbert's advice. The wife of a uh, court tree minister uh, could have come skill and will to help the sick. More particularly, he adds that I shall not judge it amiss to transcribe. According for selves, his wife seeks not the city, but prefers her garden and fields before all outlandish gums. And surely Hyssop Valerian Mercury... Adder's tongue, uh, yarrow, uh, Meliot, St. John's wort, uh, made into a salve, and uh, elder, chamomile, m mallows, comfrey, and smallage made into a pullet have done great and rare cures. So, you know, we have this record of these people using this stuff. We, you know, here is Salem, this shipping town that even before mercury was discovered in the u.s they would have you know likely been importing it from spain and from italy as well because it would have been highly valued by the hatters and and uh gold uh people etc you know uh, like we discovered like again up at the uh, emperor mine that they needed mercury to separate the gold from the rest of the stuff so um, connecting this to, of course, people might not remember, they might not have seen our multiple series upon Salem now. Cotton Mather was one of the original pamphleteers and propagandists for the first American inoculation campaign. And a lot of people might not realize that the use of inoculations and experimenting with inoculations goes way back to the very beginning of U.S. history. So after the Salem witch trials and Cotton Mather promoting spectral evidence, his next major campaign, if you will, that he launches is to push forward inoculation experiments upon the public in Massachusetts. And we found that in 1730 and 1774, there were actually riots 
in the town of Marblehead, which would have been part of Salem. Marblehead was also one of the towns that was part of Salem. And people were rioting because these uh, Cotton Mather and others were injecting people with these early inoculations, making people sick and people didn't trust the medicine. And uh, there were riots and Cotton Mather, actually someone made a homemade bomb and tried to throw it into Cotton Mather's house. And it didn't go off, of course, but people rioted. And I think people might want to connect this into our uh, research with Cinnabar and Mercury. I'm not exactly sure yet. Who knows? We don't really know exactly what they would have put into these early uh inoculations, if you will, but that's part of a larger subject that we still need to research. Now, it looks like we might have another troll here, but they think, you know, even though we've done all of this, you know, they have a very, uh, the use of the word witch was just a hysterical reaction to something they didn't understand. Now, this is the reaction of people who haven't studied anything on witchcraft, and much less they don't understand logos. And when you begin to understand that logos logic, reason, truth, the word, the right-hand path, living and walking in truth, having honor, etc. That's one thing. And then anything that's contrary to that, uh, people that use poisons and herbs to kill people, to cause plagues, use mercury to poison people, um, uh, create uh, sophism and spells like, for instance, pretending that the Puritans or the Purim were Christians and not crypto-Jews and casting a spell upon the Christians and blaming Christianity for 326 years. That's what witchcraft is. It's not this nonsense that people think today, you know, this nonsense sold by guys like uh, Mircha, uh, Mircha Iliade at uh, uh, the University of Chicago, uh, who basically created modern-day Wicca, which is what they promote today. They don't get that it's about you know, uh, eugenics uh, and suppressing, uh, you know, creation and, you know, uh, reproduction, etc. Uh, you know, so we get ignorant comments like this where, you know, when someone who doesn't live in honor and truth, uh, you know, comes across this information, they automatically think that the people and, you know, Puritans were just hysterical and they make ignorant comments like that that uh, they didn't understand what witchcraft was. No, they had a great understanding. In fact, when you go through and you read these witchcraft books and uh, you understand what it is, you can see that the Satanists and the, you know, the Wicca peop people and all of them, they have basically gone through these books and they have inverted them, reversed engineered them for all the crap that they do on the people. And in fact, you can see that vaccines today uh, are a form of witchcraft. And we're going to go into that uh, and, you know, here in just a second, we're going to go into it more. So, you know, the, the witchcraft in Salem, when, when you get, okay, so we've covered Mercury, we've covered the alchemists and what they were doing. So we have this quote here, uh, for, and, you know, John D., who is a spy for the Queen Elizabeth and, you know, all of the alchemists, et cetera, that I've exposed over the years, they all worship this guy along with uh, Hassani Sabah, and, uh, you know, some of these others. So let's pull up John D. just for a second. You know, he gets into humanism. Alistair Crowley worships him. All of the Satanists. Terence McKenna worships him. He was a spy for the Queen, you know, Queen Elizabeth. You know, if we want to talk about Emanuel Swedenborg, he was a spy for King George, the, what, the 14th of uh, Sweden, etc. They're all spies. They're all doing the same stuff. Uh, you know, John Diaz, who started promoting the overpopulation myth, he's heavy into the Philosopher's Stone, uh, which we just exposed, is Mercury. And so, you know, in these quotes here from him, uh, he talks about, let me see if I can find it. Well, the name of the cipher, which I showed on screen earlier, let me just show that again, this cipher here. Uh, it's the great work, the philosoph Philosopher's Stone, the magnum opus. It's the hieroglyphic monad, and it was created by British Rosicrucian and spy, John D. And uh, he was a close confidant and the spy for Queen Elizabeth, who issued him license to practice alchemy and make gold. Of course, John D. also ran the mines back then, if I can recall, unless I'm confusing him with Emanuel Swedenborg. But uh, uh, he had uh, proved the existence of the universal monad, which, uh, according to Pythagoras, was the first thing that came into existence in the universe. In this section, the monad, 
all the glyphs of the seven planets and their associated metals, Saturn, lead, Jupiter, 10, Mars, iron, Venus, copper, Mercury, quicksilver, moon, silver, and sun, gold intersect. The heart of the monad and, and the cipher, one cipher that encompasses all the others is Mercury. Again, one cipher that encompasses all the others is Mercury. There's the sign of Mercury. The one that encompasses all the others is Mercury. The alchemical Mercury stands as the principle of transformation itself. Again, to trans to uh, transfer gold and to get gold out of the ore, etc. They use Mercury to do this. That's how they separate the different metals. So, you know, turning whatever into gold, they're actually using Mercury to do this. It's part of the mining process. It's how it's done. So they put it right in your face. And then it's also part of, uh, you know, John D says, uh, I'll, I'll, hold on, let me just, I'm skipping ahead. But uh, when the alchemists depicted the monad, they often added the Latin caption, in hoc signo uh, vinces, in this sign you will conquer. So <laughs> with mercury, with cinnabar, you'll conquer. By poisoning people and causing plagues, you're gonna you're gonna conquer by using uh, uh, inoculations and vaccines. You're going to conquer, you know. And then John D says that you know he purified his soul with this process uh, and learning the monad, etc. But you can see how it all ties together. Again, thanks everyone for you know supporting and, and donating to the show. We can use all your support and help that uh, uh, that we can get. The appreciation of the earth is somehow this person is just a troll. They're banned. All right, John, can I jump in now? Sure. Okay, so people were talking about um, John D in the uh, chat quite a bit, which is good. We've got a smart audience. So, um, yes, John D was a steganographer for the uh, English Crown, and guess what? So many members of the Royal Society were all steganographers, and it seems like the more that I look into alchemy. You can see its connection to steganography and the coded langu language within alchemy and then how that connects to Freemasonry. If you start to research American uh, Freemasonry and its foundation within the United States. And guess what? Uh, so many. Cotton Mather and all these members of the Royal Society. Wow. Were also, thank you, Ernesto. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. We're, woo, we're also members of freemasonry and the royal society so yes it seems like you join one of these clubs they all would have known about this and um yes they were also the individuals who were running the whole salem operation if you will so let's see you know you know, they were they were the satanists they were the witches it was the you know the puritans themselves this is what people don't get the Puritans themselves were the witches, and they cast the spell. They did all of this stuff, and then they pointed the finger at everybody else to pretend that it wasn't them. I just I want to say that I think there is a possibility that um, some of the people that were uh, prosecuted and hung during the Salem trials were actually innocent. Um, I'm willing to accept the fact that perhaps like Rebecca Nurse, she was like a seriously old lady who is bedridden. She was actually renting from one of the judges who prosecuted her. There could have been uh, other issues at play between these families. But I am definitely saying that Cotton Mather was a witch. I mean, just if Absolutely. you think about the experiments like he did on people, his lying. We, we've transcribed. Jan okay. spent like a couple hours transcribing some of his notes. You know, a lot of this stuff is encrypted and it's hard to get a hold of. And he is really a very extremely important part of the founding of the United States that people don't want to talk about. See, you know, let's put this another way. You know, all of those CIA agents and doctors who are doing all those human experiments and printing all that stuff, that's witchcraft. I mean, to think that witchcraft doesn't exist is asinine. I mean, I <laughs> thank you, Uncommon Conspiracies, for the $5 donation. Much appreciated. You know, when, when I went into this, I thought, you know, witchcraft, hooey pooey and this and that. But when you get in, I wish I d brought down the other book. Uh, and Hammer I, of I, the Heretics. The Hammer of the Heretics. And, you know, but these books really explain it. And when you get that it's all of this stuff that they're doing against natural law and harming others, then you can understand what witchcraft is. And then you all of a sudden you have the realization, wait, this is stuff that that is accepted all around us today. But the Puritans 
are the ones who cast the spell. And then we see, you know, schools like Harvard and Yale and uh, uh, oh shoot, Cambridge, etc. They're they are the ones perpetuating this whole myth uh, that these were Christians who did all of this stuff, you know, and when you get logos and you get that, you know, we've done shows on this, how it's inverted and that, that when logos or truth is inverted, this is Satanism and deception and where witchcraft and all of this stuff comes from. So, you know, why I stated at the beginning of this episode, uh, why people should skip Halloween this year and probably each additional one is that, uh, the okay so let's just get right to it let's cut to the chase here we have the the witch's hat the pointed hat with the buckle on the front that's a modification of the puritan hat we have the cauldron what were the witches brewing was this just mystical stuff why don't we and let's pull up um the notes again here, I have... Corpse medicine. Well, yes, and we have corpse medicine that was being practiced there at Salem, and we've talked about that some before. But now let's just take a gander over at William Shakespeare, 1564 to 16, uh, 1616. And he's, of course, the author of Macbeth. And I'm going to show this on screen here. So in a dark cave... In the middle, a cauldron boiling. Thunder, enter three witches. Which one? Thrice, the brinded cat hath mewed. Which two? Thrice, and once, the hedge pig whined. Which three? Harpier's cries, tis time, tis time. Which one? Round about the cauldron go. In the poison entrails throw. Toad, that, excuse me, that under cold stone... Okay, now, when you look up witchcraft in these things, what, what do toads and snakes carry? Lots of poisons. So anything poisonous and toads and serpents, snakes were considered dark. Days and nights hath 31. Shelter venom, sleeping got. So, okay, so we add venom. We add, it's got to be done in a month of 31 days. Boil thou first. I, the charmed pot, all double, double toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, which to fillet of a finny snake. Here we go. The poisons in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and toe of frog, wool of, a, of bat and tongue of dog, otter's fork and blind worm sting, lizard's leg and owlet's wing. An owl, that's, well, that's a symbol of the Illuminati and the, you know, the... The, uh, oh, shoot, up in Northern California, the Owls Group, the... Uh, Bohemian Grove. Thank you. Uh, you know, so for a charm of powerful trouble, like a hell broth boil and bubble, all double, double doil and tr uh, toil and trouble, fire burn and cauldron bubble, which three, scale of dragon, tooth of wolf, witch's tummy, ma and gulf, of the raven, okay, so what is the raven here? Uh, a raven was Cain's helper. The raven pecked on the ground to show Cain where to bury Abel's body. Uh, also, uh, Mercury or Cinnabar is called the red dragon. Right. So, and then where did I just put that again? And so, uh, let's see. And the, yeah, so the scale of the dragon. So that could very well be uh, Cinnabar, which we showed a bit ago. Let me just show that photo Makes again here. Makes people crazy. Makes people go cray cray. All right. So... There's the cinnabar again, the red stone, the red scale, and uh, witches, mummy, ma, and gulf of the ravens, sea salt, shark, root of hemlock. Of course, hemlock is poisonous, uh, digged in the dark. Okay, so it is dug up in the dark. Liver of a blaspheming Jew. That's kind of redundant. Gall of a goat, the slips of a ewe, silvered in the, noons, uh, in the moon's eclipse, nose of a Turk, and a Tartar's lips. Okay, now we've been exposing Tartary in this whole thing. So that's very interesting that Tartary, uh, that, that, that a Tartar's lips is part of this poisonous brew. Finger of the birth strangled babe. Okay, so here we have uh, another aspect where the midwife comes in and some of these people, the, the midwives would be accused of killing the babies at birth. So finger of, this, uh, of a birth strangled babe. Mm -hmm. Ditch delivered by a drabe. Make the gruel thick and slab. 
and there too a tiger's uh, chaudron for the ingredients of our cauldron. All double, double toil and trouble, fire and burn, cauldron bubble, which to cool it with a baboon's blood, then the charm is firm and good. So what this is, ladies and gentlemen, as we started off from the TV show quotes earlier when they were talking about delivering the plague, and let me go back up to that, uh, the, the centennial. Uh, so w when we delivered the plagues, we wept. So what, these, what the witch's cauldron is and this, this symbol that everybody celebrates at Halloween, the Puritan's witch's hat, and they uh, put on all this stuff. Uh, I'm just pulling this up, witch's cauldron. Um, these are symbols of plague and mass death and murder, folks. You know, this is the symbol of what they used to create the poisons to commit mass murder. And they put feces and everything bad in it that you can imagine. And then everywhere they went, there was mass genocide. Now, do you want to cover some of uh, the places where we've discovered the genocides, Holly? Well, I mean, this is... This gets kind of far out, but when you start thinking about um, all of the different um, pox diseases, um, they're derived, the great pox is syphilis, which sort of magically appeared. They have the pre-Columbian and post-Columbian theory about where syphilis came from. Also the black plague the, uh, is, was also bubonic plague, was also a type of pox disease. These are all viruses. And uh, they get into your body, smallpox, people might be more familiar with chicken pox, you know, there's cow pox, and we see modern strains of these, uh, it's, you know, human and animal mixtures that uh, seem to spread and murder people. And uh, uh, Jan, you're, you're going to jump in. Quiet Storm just hit the nail on the head. Might this be the same formula they used on Grand Tartary? Yes, we think this is exactly what they did. So, yep, someone's talking about the plague caused by rats, spread by fleas, as we've talked about in the past. Uh, the Royal Society, uh, Robert Hook, was, was examining the plea plague, uh, the plague flea, sorry, when it broke out in 1666 in England. Just a coincidence there, folks. Yeah, and, and that's, then, that's putting the cart before the horse. The Black Plague is caused by rats. You know, when we start to look at this and... You know, the, when the when Judaism was banned in Europe, they were actually banned for spreading the plague. And everywhere, when we look at when the Moranos left Spain and traveled everywhere they went, plagues broke out. And before, you know, a few weeks ago on the show, I read a text from the Florentine Codex, from the 16th century Florentine Codex, uh, where the uh, Aztecs were discussing how you know the Spanish brought the plague and wiped everybody out, and then they attacked. And this happened uh, to the Pequots up in uh, Massachusetts and Maine, et cetera. So, yep. you know, and, and you know, everywhere they went, essentially the Puritans and these crypto-Jews had spread the plague with them. So this is the theme of witchcraft and Halloween that we celebrate today. And one thing I want to mention here really quickly, the the story of Han, uh, Hansel and Gretel and luring the children with candy to the house and then the cauldron and the kids go in the pot and everything. We suspect they were, you know, testing this stuff on the kids, using the children to lure them in with this stuff, exactly like the Halloween ritual is celebrated today. So we, I've, this is probably for another show, but I also examined and discovered that before the plagues hit New England and wiped out the native people just right before the Puritans showed up. Of course, this also happened in Ireland in the uh, 1650s under Cromwell's Commonwealth. The uh, Irish were wiped out with massive plagues and uh, they were enslaved and there was a rebellion, if you will, against against the Puritans in Ireland. And then also this happened with it seemed like also the Jesuits were spreading in Canada 
and uh, with the Iroquois, they spread uh, some sort of a black plague or some sort of unknown pox plague that was uh, talked about from the primary resources that we can find. So a lot of this, you know, seems to connect to a larger issue of we see these plagues spread throughout Europe, North America, Ireland, uh, the West Indies, etc., just as these uh, groups of people come in to take over the land. Okay, so <clears throat> Volker just hit the nail on the head. And uh, thanks, Ernesto, for the $50 donation on top of the $100 donation. Wow, we really appreciate all the support tonight. Volker said, it's like participating in the spell of our own destruction, and that's exactly what Halloween is. It's a an annual mocking of them poisoning and plaguing our ancestors. Now, if you think of the Black Plague in Europe, this killed 70 million people, okay? So, you know, this every year, and, you know, the, the, the Satanist church put out a thing recently saying, you know, that they are so glad that Americans celebrate, you know, Halloween every year because of the ties to all of this stuff. And when you understand what the witches and Halloween is really about, you're going out and playing, you're participating in this mock ritual of your own sacrifice. Guess where the satanic headquarters are in the United States? Anyone in the audience now? What city? And uh, should I just give it away? Nobody's typed it yet. It is Salem. Salem, so, Massachusetts, Satanic and Headquarters. And where's the biggest annual Halloween celebration? Salem. What What is the city that puts this kind of crap, let me just pull this over, on as their city logo? This is what they are celebrating. They put it in your face. You got the mock hat, the Puritan hat, the whole thing. I mean, the Puritans were... You know, the Purim who celebrate the death of the 75,000 of Haman and they consider the Native Americans, the Canaanites and the Amalekites. And they've, you know, for centuries committed these genocides and then spun it and blamed the Christians. We can see, you know, the the historical agenda going on when we, you know, when we care to look at this stuff. And, you know, all of these, all of these, these, uh, memorials everywhere that they put up, you know, they're mocking us. They're laughing at, at us in our faces, you know, and here's this other one that I, you know, here's me at the, uh, at the John Proctor, uh, Memorial wall. Of course they just, you know, okay. So this happened 326 years ago. They put up this memorial last year and this up above the hill behind me. And this photo here is supposed to be the location where the witches were hanged. Now, who knows? It seems kind of odd that they would have trucked them back in that day all the way from Salem Village over to that hill just to be hung and went just hang them in the regular gallows where all the rest of the criminals were hung. I don't know. But when you start to see, you know, witchcraft is a real thing and, you know, kidnapping children and poisoning people and spreading plagues and disease. This was, you know, a big deal. This wasn't just, you know, oh, you don't, you know, these were stupid people and they didn't understand what was going on. Start, you know, for a minute, you know, all of these books behind me play up the same game, that the people were just crazy, they were stupid, we have to blame the family, like Demo says, etc. What if just for a minute this stuff was real and everything we've been told was phony and it's all been inverted on us and they're all using fallacies? You know, so when you get the trick, you can start to unfold all of this. So, uh, so let's also think about it this way. I mean, how would they have spread the plague? People were like, okay, rats, free, fleas, putting it in the water, you know, uh, corpse medicine, putting bodies in the water. We saw it was popular. There was a whole section of the witch house. That poisoning about, the well. Yeah, talking about... Uh, corpse medicine, how collecting bodies and selling body parts was popular with Puritans. Well, what if you could actually dose people by, let's say, injecting it directly into your bloodstream? Well, and you get, you know, you get uh, people like Governor Moonbeam to pass laws that people have to get their alchemical injection of, of this witchcraft poison that we now call vaccines i mean vaccines that is the ultimate witchcraft it is the witch's brew 
and they poison you with it, and they contaminate your body, your temple with it, and that's that's what spreads the disease. That's what causes autism. That what that's what corrupts the minds of people, and and is creating the you know the alpha. Beta, Delta, Epsilons, etc. In Aldous Huxley's books, you know Aldous Huxley, another witch. When you get what this stuff really is, and how they're attacking and destroying the family, attacking our ability to to have families and reproduce, Planned Parenthood, etc. This is why you weren't to suffer a witch to live, because they committed mass genocide. So uh, just to jump in, people were like, wasn't there a strange mist or some sort of omens that would hit people before these plagues? We have discovered there does seem to be a correlation between Halley's Comet and uh, when these plagues hit. So that might also be part of a larger occult ritual. Uh, We haven't exactly followed that 100% yet, but yes, there does seem to be you know, 1666, uh, Halley's Comet was observed in England right before the uh, plague in England and also the Great Fire, which conveniently burned down a lot of old London and they could rebuild the official city of London, the bank system after that in 1666. And so Con Mather <laughs> and others also talk about Halley's Comet coming and uh, a comet foretelling a terrible disease, etc. So, yes, good point. So I was just showing up on screen the plague and the fire there. But uh, somebody is asking, Mark is asking if there's any connection to Salem and Oregon. I don't know. That's a good question. You know, if you think of Portland, Oregon is actually named after Portland, Maine, which used to be, uh, you know, Massachusetts, you know, maybe. I don't know, though. Yeah, and also just uh, anecdotally, Salem, New Hampshire is the location of America's Stonehenge, which we didn't get a chance to check out, but um, there's something else. So yeah, interesting connection to Salem and uh, bizarre happenings. Always with the bizarre happenings. So, you know, <laughs> you know, and then what they do is they create the spell or the lie around the story, and then they blame... They always blame the Christians, you know, number one. But, you know, so you have the Royal Society and the Puritans uh, uh, all under the the Mayflower Compact. Now, a few shows ago, we did cover the Mayflower Compact and its association to Beltane and uh, Valpurgisnacht, which is the Night of the Witches or, uh, you know, and that's, that's May Day, May 1st, which is also the scream for the the communists and now and the communists celebrate may day and in fact the people the, of the mayflower and the massachusetts bay colony the the massachusetts commonwealth commonwealth is another term for communism so you know and we can see all the way back that they use these these communist ploys they spun everything they were using poisons you know dead bodies and uh uh, 15 skeletons found in Benjamin Franklin's basement. If uh, people aren't uh, familiar with that, let me just pull that up. Uh, so usually it pulls up the Smithsonian when you search that. So that's always, uh, uh, let's see, here's the Smithsonian's website. When, why was Ben Franklin's basement filled with skeletons? So there was, you know, and the, oh, you know, he's a great guy and he was a father of our country and his mom was a Puritan and he became a Quaker and whatever, you know, and, and that's uh, Charles Upham and all of them. They, they intentionally shut down Puritanism after they were done, done with it. But uh, so Ben Franklin had 15 bodies and then we find letters. The first thing he does when he finishes school, I think it was at Harvard or wherever, he immediately goes to see Cotton Mather. And then Cotton, Cotton Mather, I think, is his handler. They were both pamphleteers or propagandists. They're both promoting the inoculations. You know, and then we find 15, 15 bodies in his basement, et cetera. So they're doing human experiments. Cotton Mather's house is nearly bombed for his inoculation experiments, et cetera. I mean, you just, you know, it's hard to, to say, okay, we have a document that proves this whole thing. But we can see we have the letters from uh, Ben Franklin, James Franklin's uh, printing company, who is uh, working with Dr. Uh, what's his name? Hold on, uh, James Franklin. And he was working with, you know, uh, 
uh, Dr. William Douglas, who is another member of the Royal Society. And then uh, with him and Ben Franklin and everybody, they're controlling the entire dialectic from each side of the inoculation experiments and everything that's going on. And then, of course, we're lied to in the public that the first inoculation experiments were like in the 1800s or whatever, when they were, you know, in the 1690s and early 1700s with Cotton Mather and Ben Franklin and these guys. And wasn't Ben Franklin one of the first people to go out publicly in favor of inoculations? You know, and then uh, uh, Ben Franklin and uh, his brother... Here, that's, here's James Franklin actually founded the American Hellfire Club based off of the uh, British Hellfire Club, and uh, which is, is similar to the Bohemian Club, which we mentioned earlier. But Dr. William Douglas was also a member of the Hellfire Club who was working with James and Frank, uh, Ben Franklin. And, you know, so, I mean, they're, they're all Royal Society. They're all... Hellfire Club, which is a satanic club where they do satanic rituals and, you know, human sacrifices and murder people and every bit of licentious behavior you can imagine. This is the history that we're not told of Ben Franklin and these psychopaths. And, you know, and frankly, the founding of the United States. Well, and so what they do and you constantly hear this argument against the uh, Christians is that, well, because of the Puritans being Christian, then the Enlightenment happened, and then that led to the Revolution, which led to separation of church and state, and yay, now we have America to protect us from those evil Christians who did all of that stuff at Salem. And then when you get the whole joke that the Puritans were Purim, and they weren't Christians, and they were just using a Christian veneer to do this stuff and to cast their spell, then you can see this this whole picture. And then you can understand why I said at the beginning of the show that I'm going to plea with people to not go out and celebrate Halloween this year. And, you know, trust me, when I was a kid growing up, you know, here in Southern California, you know, everybody went to Irvine Meadows Amphitheater to see Oingo Boingo play, Dia de los Muertos. That was a big thing, man. You know, Halloween was my big holiday and now i'm saying you know we gotta hit the brakes on this and think about it a little bit more critically all right so i'm not exactly sure if we're gonna actually get into uh puritans and the talking about uh communism and the commonwealth and then my uh recent research on the first great awakening and the second great awakening which branched off of uh, cotton mather's work so we might have to save that for another show. Yeah, we have a lot more too. And we need to do, I think we need to give the audience a little uh, thing, to, you know, because we have a whole show lined up just on Ireland and Cromwell. Uh, Holly has been doing a lot of research on, you know, basically investigating Salem has opened up so many, you know, rabbit holes. It's ridiculous. But so that was all spun and blamed on, of course, the, the British when it was Cromwell and the communists who slaughtered the Irish. And, uh, you know, so, you know, half of Holly's family is Irish. So, you know, so she's got close ties there. I've got Irish and Welsh and Scottish, you know, Gaelic background in my family history as well. So, um, you know, Cromwell is who went and, you know, they, they uh, regicided uh, King Charles I and then they bring in King Charles II, who is a Puritan puppet. And then he legalizes uh, Judaism and allows usury and all of this stuff to go on. And then by 1824, Charles Upham takes over the first Salem or Danvers church and then converts the church to Unitarianism. By then, most of them had converted to back to Judaism or to Quakerism or to Unitarianism and other forms of congregationalism, which basically was a divided church. And those who know the New Testament, it's very clear that the church is supposed to be one. So a divided church of a bunch of separate small churches is very uh, against the church, and it would be against the Tartar church, essentially, which would probably be Orthodox or something of that sort. But, you know, uh, it appears that they took over the Catholic church and started promoting you know, uh, they the first clue that the Catholic Church is co-opted 
is that the church fathers, the church priests aren't real fathers. And so, you know, the, and when you understand this stuff, you understand that it's supposed to be a real father, a real alpha male invested in the community. And he's, you know, teaching the people, not these, you know, people that prey on the community and on the children and the, you know, in the uh, orphanages, et cetera. So, you know, uh, we have to get the, the, the churches recombine and get, you know, if the Catholic Church actually does, and they've been talking about it, going back to married priests, that has to be done. And anybody who isn't married needs to be pushed out. So that's just my opinion on that. But anyway. Yep. So we'll be able to connect that in the future to um, the first great awakening, second great awakening, and all this splintering of Protestantism and what we call the all the new American Christianity churches and evangelicalism and the rapture and all that sort of stuff that we see in uh, the modern fanatical Christianity, I think. And that's what people think uh, of when they think of Christianity in the United States. So, you know, lots to unravel here. So, And, you know, I'm going to be having uh, uh, Mark Brown on hopefully this Tuesday, if uh, he's able to get his PowerPoint ready. Hi, Mark, if you're out there in the audience listening. And uh, he's been investigating this whole thing and the, the rapture and how that was spun to take Christians away from understanding Logos and uh, understanding, oops, I keep going through the wrong windows here, understanding what Christianity really was and getting caught into this deity worship and the rapture and we're all supposed to float up in space and everything. These are psyops <laughs> and, and ridicule that have been leveled against people so that they don't figure out that Christianity is about Logos, where that means... Logos, if you look it up, means reason, it means truth. You know, basically, Logos is the word, and so God is reason, the word, it's logic, it's truth. And so anything antithesis to that, anything that's antithesis to truth, logic, and reason is considered Satanism. And when you understand this simple, you know, core concept, then you can understand why they would be going after witches and this uh, sort of thing. And because it's not living in truth and these people were a threat to the culture in general. Now, going back to Nathaniel Haw uh, Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter and you know the woman having to wear an A on her, uh, a scarlet letter A on her chest uh, to identify her as a harlot, you know, and, and people go, oh, boo-boo, they were so strict. But if you think of a small community and you think of a woman going around and sleeping with all these you know, husbands and whatnot, and the discord that that would cause in a small community that's, you know, struggling to survive, then it makes sense. But you have to put it in the proper context. You have to think about it. What does this kind of behavior cause? Does it cause harmony in the community or utmost discord? Oh, wait, the discordians are Satanists. Yeah, I think, was it Bridget Bishop? One, one of the women was definitely charged with... Uh, you know, sleeping with several women's husbands and whatnot. And Sarah and so on. Goodman or something like that, you know. But yeah, so, you know, we have to look at these things as the impact at the time. And, you know, we have to begin to understand it. And uh, you're welcome, uh, Liberty and Death. And, you know, thanks, everyone. You know, and thank you all for supporting the show. Thank you, Ernesto and Matt and... Uh, everyone else who support, I don't know if I can scroll back that far. Vent support, uh, donated five bucks. Uncommon Conspiracies supported the show again. You guys are awesome. You know, so we right. really need the donations yeah. and support. It was not cheap staying in Salem for, you know, several days and doing research and all those books haven't been cheap. So we really appreciate everyone's support. Please also go to the Gnostic Media website and donate, uh, you know, there. You can send uh, Bitcoin or whatever as well and uh, go to Holly's um, Patreon account. And somebody's emailed me this week and I had Patreon up to start creating an account. I, I haven't yet. So and I disagree with Holly just asking for seven or 14. If you want to donate 20 <laughs> or 50 or 100, you know, or be more generous than that, please do. You know, don't just go for the low ball. Let's shoot for the high ball. We have to... Uh, you know, we need the, the support and funds for that. So, all right. 
So anyway, there's All our right, thanks, guys. That, there's our begging segment for support and donations from the listening audience. So thanks, yeah. and you know we're commercial free and all that. So that's it. Good night, everyone, and uh, take care. We'll see you this week. Hopefully, Mark Brown will be on. All right. God bless. Bye.